Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our final Space Forum of the year, uh, 2023 Space Year in Review, something we've done uh, the last few years uh, as we close out a really exciting year in space. As always, I'd like to share my uh, uh, welcome and, and thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, I always like to do a kind of a quick agenda. So we'll just go through some virtual etiquette. As always, a few NSS announcements, uh, then talk about what's coming up in terms of the space forums. Uh, then uh, we'll get right into the program and then we'll close out for the evening. So in terms of asking questions, feel free to submit a question using the Q&A function. Uh, it's best because those typically go directly to our speakers and panelists, uh, and it's easy to pull the questions out. Uh, but feel free to use comments in the chat or ask questions through the chat. We just ask that you be respectful of all the speakers and the audience as you do that, because everyone can see that. All, as always, we welcome, we welcome your donations to support our activities. So if you're enjoying the space forums, the town halls, uh, please donate to support the NSS. Thanks to everybody who's donated in the past. And all those, I'll give you an advance thank you if you donate tonight. Uh, I will put this into the chat, as always, put the link into the chat. And also, please feel free to complete the post-space forum survey. It only takes a few minutes to complete it, uh, and it is anonymous. And as I said before, it always helps us in our planning uh, to improve what we're doing and also help us guide us as we uh, plan future events. So I would like to just talk about a couple items that are coming up uh, that are pretty important. I mentioned this uh, during our last session. We've created an exclusive members tour of the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, this is going to be operated by Galactic McDallion, which is a local travel company that focuses in on tours of the Space Center. Uh, this will occur Friday on January 12th to Sunday, January 14th. It's three days and two nights. Uh, the first night is a welcome, reception, and dinner. Uh, then on the 13th, you have we have the tour of the Space Center, uh, the, and including the VAB, the LC-39 gantry, the launch pads, and the Apollo Saturn Center. Uh, and of course, you'll see the uh, space shuttle uh, Atlantis as well. So I'm going to talk about, about that a little bit more in just a second. Uh, on the 14th is the tour of the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, uh, Hangar C, and the Complex uh, 26 Blockhouse. Uh, the hotel that we're using is the uh, court Courtyard by Marriott. Titusville and also Kennedy Space Center. It is a tremendous venue uh, overlooking the Kennedy Space Center. You can get a clear view of the launch pads and also the VAB from there. Uh, and they have a great uh, venue called the Space Bar uh, that overlooks everything. So uh, I encourage you to th think about this. We sent out a message uh, last week. We'll be sending out another message. Uh, as a reminder, we've got a number of people who've already signed up. Uh, you're going to be getting a private experience that, of course, celebrates our space history, but also excites you about the space future. That that blue building there in the picture is called the Gateway, and there's a lot of things in there, including a side a, a side booster from uh, a Falcon Heavy, uh, and also a Dragon spacecraft, an Orion spacecraft, and some great rides. That is also part of the tour. Uh, is this going to be exclusive? We're going to bring the Space Center up close and personal to you. Uh, and it's going to be, uh, you're going to have opportunities to meet and network with fellow NSS members uh, and space industry experts. And we've got a lot of great surprises for you as well. You will also be able to see the new office uh, that we have at the Center for Space Education. And we just found out today, you're going to get a special tour uh, of the uh, Atlantis from a retired uh, flight director, Mike Leinbach, uh, who's agreed to, to show you around. Uh, and that is going to be really special. So think about that. And again, there are some other surprises that we have for you. 
Uh, this is a discounted price of $15.65 for NSS members. Non-members are welcome. Uh, and if you have any questions about the tour, uh, Elizabeth Schneider, who is the CEO of Galactic Medallion, uh, she's a member of NSS, but also she's on uh, the uh, Space Forum this evening and can answer any questions about it uh, in the chat. So really hope to see you there uh, on the 12th to the 14th. Uh, I I did mention this the last time too, and I you know there potential always a potential for a launch, uh, so keep that in mind because they've had 68 launches this year uh, already, uh, so that's more than one a week. So there's always that potential. So look for the another announcement in your email, but again I will put this link into the uh, chat. Uh, now, also, another big event that's coming up in 2024 is the International Space Development Conference. That's going to be in Los Angeles from May 23rd to 26th at the Sheraton Gateway uh, at Los Angeles International Airport. Uh, the theme is No Limits in Space. Uh, so join us. It's the 42nd annual ISDC. A lot of great topics, uh, everything from space solar power to Mars to living in space. The space elevators and also uh, also featuring uh, the space ambassadors who we just had uh, a couple weeks ago and of course uh, our moderator for tonight is uh, Jim Plaxico another space ambassador so uh, make sure you uh, attend that uh, it's an opportunity of course to engage with uh, a lot of space leaders astronauts industry scientists and engineers space enthusiasts uh, and you'll learn all about the latest achievements in space what's coming up next uh, and so on. It is an amazing way to get energized about space. Uh, and it, the Los Angeles, the Sheraton Gateway is a great venue uh, for this. We've had uh, several great ones in the past there. So definitely encourage you to check out the website. Uh, registration is now open. So we already had people registering for it. So I definitely encourage you uh, to, uh, to join us. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you there in Los Angeles. So we'll see you here in uh, Kennedy Space Center in January and in Los Angeles in, in May. What's coming up in terms of our space forums? Uh, as I mentioned the last time, we are planning a session on the Intuitive Machines Nova C Moon Lander with Chantel Beyer. That will be January 11th, the day before our tour starts. Uh, so more to come on that as we get into the new year. We'll be sending out an announcement. And we're working with uh, Danica Vallone, uh, who gave an incredibly fun talk at the Space Settlement Summit about space in the movies. Uh, we're just working to finalize her date, whether it's the 18th or the 25th. Uh, we'll definitely know that uh, in, in hopefully in the next few days we're lining that up. Uh, and we're actually looking at a lot of different talks uh, in 2024. So hopefully we'll have a much more complete schedule as we move into the new year. So again, a lot going on. So thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, I think we now we're ready to get started with our program. Uh, so it's my pleasure right now uh, to introduce our, our program for the evening. And this is something we've done, as I mentioned uh, a few times over the last few years, and our speaker tonight uh, has made, a, uh, made this a special presentation. He's done it many times, not just for us, for a lot of other organizations and we always enjoy it. So to introduce our speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Space Ambassador uh, and also president of the Chicago Society for Space Studies, uh, Jim Plaxico, who is our, also gonna be moderating tonight's session. So Jim, I'm gonna turn that over to you. Great, thank you very much, Bert. And good evening, everyone. Uh, you know, we've had some major news stories here uh, in 2023 with respect to space. And us folks at Chicago Society for Space Studies, chicagospace.org, got to get the plug in for that. Uh, we've really been fortunate in that our former president and current vice president, Larry Boyle, uh, has been giving us the rundown uh, on all the key space events for over 40 years now. And that's got to be some kind of record. Uh, for And just by way of background, CSSS was founded in 1977. So as a heads up, 
I'll be monitoring the chat and the question and answer while Larry is giving us the scoop on this year's big stories. And there will be time uh, at the end when we can put Larry on the spot with our questions. So Larry, without further ado, take it away. Okay. Uh, and we can get the slides up. I will get the slides up in a second there. We're getting ready to go. There we go. I am ready. I'm going to share my screen again. Oops, just got to move one thing out of the way. <laughs> okay. There we go. And here it goes. Anytime you're ready, Larry. Uh, next, please. Yeah. And as we mentioned, this is uh, over 40 years we've been doing this review of what goes on in space. And when we started, it was easy to do basically everything. Now it's really hard to squeeze things in. In fact, when I, I collect these slides and stories each day every year through the year, and then toward the end of the year, I put them together. This year, I had over a thousand slides to go through and I reduced them to 135 so that we could have enough time to, to get it into the time. Next slide, please. And there are 72 nations in the world that actually have some kind of space program. Most of them are quite small and there are only about six that have really large full programs. The United States is the largest one, then China, Japan, India, Russia, and the European Space Agency, which we'll discuss a little later in the, in the program. Next slide, please. And the accounts, figures of how much is spent in space is always a little questionable because while the civilian programs usually give a, a complete accounting, a lot of the countries have military programs and they usually do not give a, as much information and especially much how much they're spending every year. So we have to make, it, it's around 500 billion, could be more, could be less. Next slide, please. Next. And starting with the, the private companies, the companies that are actually intending to make a profit in space, and there are a lot of them, Wikipedia actually has a list of space companies. And last time I counted, there were 101 in, on them. And those Wikipedia lists tend to change all the time. Next slide, please. This year, or actually last year, uh, something really important happened, I think. And that's the commercial part, the private industry part of the space market actually went above half of the total spending in space. As you can see from this slide, uh, the total they're estimating, and they're guessing here on the military programs, but it is intended that it is expected this is continuing to grow over the years. So uh, last year, it became finally private companies being the most important part of the space market. Next slide. The biggest of those private companies is SpaceX. And SpaceX is pushing toward 100 launches this year, which is more than most countries do every year. So it's, it's quite a large company. Next slide, please. Uh, you probably have heard of the Twitter dilemma that Musk is suffering through. He bought Twitter last year for $44 billion. Last time I looked, it was valued at $19 billion. So he's mo lost the most money of anybody in the history of the world in the last few months. Uh, however, SpaceX, is separate from their, is his Twitter company. And it's pr uh, the director of the program or the company says, it's really not distracting SpaceX from it, what, doing what it wants. Next slide, please. And Musk has been having some troubles actually connected to the space program too. They have a, a project called Starlink, which we'll talk a little about later and Starlink has been being used by the Ukrainians to coordinate their military activities in the war with Russia. And this year they wanted to expand that out into the Black Sea. They have something called sea drones. 
And when I read this article, I said, sea drones, what are that? Uh, Russia, after its attack, Ukraine is really innovating a lot. And they came up with these sea drones or small things that pack a lot of, of uh, explosives and they're, they're suicide sea drones. And they expected to turn on the Starlink and then attack the Black Sea Fleet, Russian Black Sea Fleet. Musk wouldn't do that because he was afraid that the Russians might start shooting at his Starlink satellites. The, the Ukrainians did eventually do a workaround and they did attack the fleet and hurt it pretty badly. Next slide, please. And then in October, again, because of the Starlink, Musk had a class with Israel. As you know, there's been a war started in Gaza on October 7th and most communications are down and Musk wants to uh, turn the Starlink on for the Gaza area so that the international aid groups can communicate. And Israel is afraid that Hamas will commandeer this access. And as of October 30th, they were still arguing about it, trying to decide what, what is gonna be done about it. Next slide, please. But this hasn't changed Musk's goal this, was for, this slide was from 20, 19, 2021, but he's still hoping to get to Mars within say the next 10, 15 years. Next slide, please. And he's financing this mainly with his Starlink system. Starlink is a constellation of uh, low orbit communication satellites designed to give quick internet access to everywhere on the planet, except for the polar areas. So you'll be able to use this to connect to the internet wherever you are on the earth, not just in cities or in developed nations, but on, in the sea, in poor nations, wherever. And right now they, they have about 5,000 of these satellites in orbit. And the eventual total is going to be about 12,000. Next slide, please. And to get to Mars, what they're using the this income from Starlink to do is build a starship. And so far they've spent about $5 billion building this system. Next slide, please. And this just shows you a kind of show of what, what the Starlink starship looks like compared to all the other major launch systems. And you can see it has the largest two low earth orbit tonnage of any system ever developed, including it's even somewhat larger than the Saturn V. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. And in April, they had their first full up test of the Starship. And uh, within about three minutes, it actually broke up. And, and SpaceX started calling that an unscheduled rapid breakup. It blew up, basically. And they got a lot, some information out of it. Next slide, please. And then in October, they did a second launch. This one got a lot further, got a lot of uh, different data and they, they were very pleased with it, even though it did in fact also blow up after several minutes, another unscheduled disintegration. Next slide. And after all these messy flights, they did have some problems with the EPA. They, EPA came to them and said, what are you doing about cleaning up this mess that you're dropping in the, in the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico? They did work out a, a plan for getting rid of that, the, the debris. Next slide, please. And the Falcon Heavy actually returned to flight. Uh, the, it's, they tested it for the first time almost five years ago. There have been some delays in getting it back into orbit, not because if there's anything wrong with the Falcon Heavy, but because the... Uh, payloads that they were scheduled to, to launch were having some troubles. Next slide, please. But they, they also used uh, Falcon Heavy by NASA, the civilian side, for the first time with uh, the Psyche mission, which we'll talk about a little later as well. Next slide, please. Another of the space companies, private space company is Virgin Galactic. Haven't heard very much about that for a while. Next slide, please. It's been nearly two years before they actually, they got a, one of their suborbital flights. And that was in May of this year. And they've now been 
launching them pretty steadily. Next slide, please. Uh, they conducted their first tourist flight, first paying tourist flight of this series in August of this year. Next slide, please. By September, they were up to the third commercial flight and the second uh, uh, astronaut flight. Next slide, please. And so, so far this year, they in six months, they've completed six successful flights. That's basically uh, one flight a month. So they have really established their uh, space plane, their suborbital space plane system now in this year. Next slide, please. The next big space company, private space company is Blue Origin. Blue Origin is Jeff Bezos's company. Next slide, please. You might also might call this a hobby for, for Jeff Bezos. And when you're the richest man in the world, you can have some very interesting hobbies. He basically spends a, a billion dollars a year, sells a billion dollars a year of Amazon stock every year to fund Blue Origin. And even spending that, Amazon keeps going so fast that he's still richer at the end of the year. But he's been producing a lot of equipment, a lot of uh, boosters that they're planning to begin using uh, probably in January. Next slide, please. Uh, he had also has a, uh, a suborbital tourist flight system. And this is a new Shepard. And uh, almost two years ago now, it actually had some problems, the engine malfunction. And this particular flight, there were no people on board just instruments. And even so they did, if there had been people aboard, they would have survived. They would have been bruised and banged up. It wouldn't have been a pleasant trip, but they would have survived. Next slide, please. They call their systems New Shepard. And that the one that crashed was New Shepard 23. And they announced in March their findings for what had caused this. There was some failure in the engine nozzle and they plan to start flying again relatively soon. In fact, they're talking about sometime this month, the latter part of this month, maybe the beginning of, of uh, next month for their first uh, New Shepard launch after the failure. And they haven't put an exact date on it yet. So, but within the next couple of weeks, you should see something like this. Next slide, please. There are other space programs, private space programs, Axiom has a manned, private manned space program. They rent their equipment from SpaceX and they have had, next slide please. This year they had the, uh, a second flight to the International Space Station. And during that flight, there actually was a new space flight record just take, take in place. There are two manned space stations in orbit right now, the Chinese and the International Space Station. Both of them have routine rotations of the crews every six months. And during those rotations for a few days, the old crew and the new crew are, are aboard. So there happened to be the middle of a, a rotation plus the Axiom mission uh, during May, on May 29th. So there were six people on the uh, Chinese space station, the old and new crew, plus the old and new crew from on the ISS plus Axiom. So you had 17 people from five different nations in orbit on that day. Next slide, please. And there is even another private manned program and that's called the Polaris system. The next, they've already had one Polaris launch and the next planned one is called Polaris Dawn. And that is going to actually have the feature the first private spacewalk, first time a non-government astronaut is going to get out of his spacecraft and walk around. That was actually scheduled for sometime this, this latter part of this year, but they had to delay that until probably March of next year. Next slide, please. And this uh, Polaris program is funded by uh, this very, very successful space businessman and, or businessman. And he bought three or rent, rented three uh, crew dragons from SpaceX. And since each one is $200 million a piece, you can see he, ha he has been a very successful businessman. Next slide, please. 
And when NASA decided to go from a government getting astronaut, government system, the space shuttle, getting astronauts to orbit to go to a private system, they did not want to be dependent on a single system to get astronauts into orbit. So they put two, two uh, contracts out, one to SpaceX for their Crew Dragon, which has been working now for a couple of years quite well, and another one to Boeing for what they call the Boeing Starliner. And that's had one unmanned test so far, but they've been having a lot of trouble with it. Next slide, please. It's costing Boeing. They, the contract they signed was uh, a straight contract. They, NASA gives them a, a certain amount of money. Any cost overruns is Boeing's responsibility. And with another delay, they're up to another 250 million. Next slide, please. And NASA has said that uh, the Starliner will only launch when it's ready. And they haven't set a, a date yet at this point. They hope to do it if it's completely ready uh, sometime in the middle of 2024. But there's no guarantee in that and there's no set date at this point. Next slide. And all these constellations, I mentioned that uh, Starlink has 5,000 satellites in orbit. And there are others, there'll be many thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit. And this has created a clash. I'm very interested in astronomy and in the space program. And I never thought the two of them would collide in any way, but they are beginning to. Uh, this is just shows some streaks in some astronomy uh, pictures. Next slide, please. And even going into orbit because some of these streaks from these satellites, these communication satellites, have actually been showing up on trails on the Hubble Space Telescope observations. Next slide, please. And the radio noise also could interfere with radio, con radio astronomy. So there's a lot of discussion about what's gonna be happening. And next slide, please. The International Dark Sky Association is actually uh, combination of amateur and professional astronomers, and they're working to, to take care of this problem. And if you have any questions, you should go to their website, which they will tell you what they're trying to do. Next slide, please. And the space between the Earth and Moon is really getting crowded, not just with government programs, but with private ones as well. And there's some possibility that they might even cause some conflicts. Next slide, please. And in connection to that, the FCC has actually put get a get the first fine for space debris, the first garbage fine in space. So even garbage men are beginning to move into space. Next slide, please. And the Japanese actually have a private company that has this unmanned lander to put payloads on the moon, and this is done as a commercial uh, operation. And there are several companies that are doing this, a couple of American ones as well. And basically, the, you can rent either the whole of the payload space they have, that's about 35 pounds, or you can rent small copies or small parts of it. And they tried, iSpace tried its first landing, it crashed, but they intend to do it again. They have another one planned for the beginning of next year. Next slide, please. And Lockheed Martin actually, announced a subsidiary they're setting up that is going to be uh, offering commercial lunar communications and navigation services around the moon. So they figure that there's gonna be enough activity around the moon to uh, justify a private commercial operations for communications and navigation. Next slide, please. And the, there was actually a demonstration of wireless power, space solar power uh, in June of this year. And they actually detected some power from Earth orbit down to a, a university in California. So that's the first step toward space solar power actually being made into a reality. Next slide, please. And China also has a, uh, a private space program. And there are a lot of other country, countries that have them. The Chinese one, until, nine, until 2015, the Chinese government wouldn't allow anybody to have commercial space programs. That year they decided to that it's okay. And now we're beginning to get, because it takes some time 
to put together a space program. The private companies are beginning to launch into space. And this particular one was the first ever methane powered rocket to reach orbit. And Starship is actually going to use methane as well. Methane isn't quite as powerful or as concentrated as other fuels, but you don't, it isn't poisonous. You don't have to keep it to sub-zero temperatures. So, so while it's less power, it's a lot cheaper overall. And there's also a company that's building a, has actually launched a system that's actually 3D printed, which is also going to save some money. So even that is being worked on. Next slide, please. Moving from the commercial private companies to the national programs. The largest is of course the one from the United States. Next slide, please. And the civilian one, the one that we have the most information about is NASA. And next slide, please. It, they're having some budget challenge in the years ahead. The government generally is having some problems with its budgeting. Uh, next slide, please. They're actually considering budget cuts for the Hubble and the Chandra, which is an X-ray space telescope. This would mean less observing time in order to save money. They haven't finally decided that they're going to do any of these cuts for Hubble or, or Chandra, but they are considering it. And also Hubble has been having some troubles with its gyroscopes. It needs three gyroscopes to point at, at scientific targets. It's down to three and a couple of them are being kind of wonky. So after 30 years in space, Hubble's beginning to get toward the end of its life. Next slide, please. The main concentration for NASA's manned program is of course the International Space Station. And that's been operating fairly smoothly for the Americans. Uh, they've been having regular churning of uh, crews in that. Next slide, please. And it was decided that, uh, finally decided to extend the operations to 2030. So like six years or so, the ISS will actually have to be deorbited. Next slide, please. And this, this cost NAS, has NASA thinking about what they're gonna do after the ISS. And they have several, they are encouraging private companies to actually put up private commercial space stations. And some of them are actually beginning to build and, and work on it. So that's the beginnings of that. Next slide, please. And they also have to deorbit the module. And this thing is very large. It's like 370 tons. And they want to be able to put it down exactly where they want it to go. They don't want to have it deorbit into some general area because they don't want to have dropped 370 tons on Washington, D.C. or Chicago or Beijing or something like that. They're aiming for the South Pacific, very far in the South Pacific, where it's basically empty. And it could cost them a billion dollars to build this module. They're beginning to make contacts with, with the uh, industry for this module. Next slide, please. The other manned program is the Artemis, which is designed to return American astronauts to the surface of the moon after 50 years. The Apollo program, which was 50 years ago, was actually named after the Greek god Apollo. And in Greek mythology, Apollo had a twin sister named Artemis, which is why they chose this name for the new Return to the Moon program. Next slide, please. And they announced a crew for Artemis II, which is scheduled for next year. And it is uh, designed to just test it, the, the system with a crew aboard. There will be no landing, but they will circle the moon. It will be basically a, a duplicate of the Apollo 8 mission, which was 50 years ago today. And a couple of interesting things, this will be the first woman to go beyond Earth orbit. And, and if you look, uh, one of the gentlemen has a Canadian flag. He is actually a Canadian citizen who works for NASA. So he will be the first non-American citizen to go beyond Earth orbit when this launches. And then after this one, in a year about or so after that, there will be the first landing on the moon. Next slide, please. And they're going to be using the space launch system. The biggest thing that happened with this system, next slide please, is that NASA finally admitted the ISS is, the ISLS is very expensive. It's about $2 billion a launch. 
And that's just for the one launch. That's a lot of money. And it's really hard to see how they can sustain this program, at least the SLS program, with that kind of, of price tag, especially with the budgeting problems. So what's going to happen with that is unclear at this moment. There's some talk about maybe trying to use the uh, Falcon Heavy, but that hasn't been decided yet. Next slide, please. Just to discussing that. And NASA also wanted the, let the landers to go to the surface of the moon to take people from the Orion capsule down to the surface of the moon. In the Apollo program, the mothership stayed in orbit and the lunar lander went down. They have, want, NASA wants this done by private companies. They chose SpaceX using a modified uh, Starship to do the first couple. And this year they announced that they're going to set another contract, this to Blue Origin, so that after the, on about the fourth landing, man landing on the moon, instead of using the Starship, they'll use this uh, lander. We can, uh, so next slide, please. They just want to keep their uh, options open to have more than one, one provider. They also have a very extensive unmanned program. The James Webb Space Telescope has now been in orbit for over a year and has been returning a lot of interesting, uh, very interesting data and pictures. And there are some other unmanned probes all over the solar system. Next slide, please. One of them is the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. This was intended to be a test just to prove that you could actually fly a helicopter in Mar on Mars. And the original plan was they're going to have five missions, just proving that it can go up and down sideways. And they are now on their 65th flight of the five planned flights. And they're using it as a scout to the, uh, for the per Perseverance rover that's on the surface. When they plant, plan a, a route for Perseverance, they have the ingenuity fly over it, looking for problems and other things like that. Next slide, please. The OSIRIS-REx was an asteroid sample return mission, and it returned after seven years after launch with a, a, bit, a sample from the asteroid Bennu. Next slide, please. And they landed in September in, in Utah, and they got this capsule back to Johnson Space Center. Next slide, please. And when they opened it up, they even before they got to the sample container, they noticed this dirt inside it. And they realized that not all the dirt that had been collected by the sampler had actually ended up in the sample container. It was spread outside this capsule as well. And so they very carefully collected all of that. And they actually found something close to uh, 60 grams on the outside of the collector, not in the collector. And they, and they expect that inside the collector, they'll probably have another, maybe even as much as 200 grams. And the goal of the whole pro program was to uh, collect 60 grams. So they've already gone way, way above their goal. And they actually haven't opened the container quite yet two of the 32 latches that hold the, con the sample container have stuck. And in ordinary circumstances, you just get a drill and drill the, the two stuck ones and that'd be all, all they have to do. But if you're drilling, you're, you're sending shards of metal all over the place and they don't want to contaminate the sample that's in the container. So they have, they're trying to work out some way to open the two, two stuck latches without contaminating the, uh, the stuff inside, but I'm sure they'll work out something. Next slide, please. And we mentioned uh, the Falcon Heavy had launched a Psyche mission. This is an unmanned probe to uh, an asteroid in the uh, main belt. It's one of the most unusual asteroids in the belt. It is basically a completely metal world, judged by the spectrum that we can collect from here on Earth. And there's some, there's no one really knows why it's there. The main or the most popular 
of the explanations is that very long ago, this was a very large body. It was large enough so that it rounded out and that the heavier elements sunk toward the bottom so that it has a core or had a core like the earth, a heavy iron core and then a mantle. And at some point, another asteroid impact to it dis dispersed the entire mantle and left the, uh, the core exposed. <laughs> Next slide, please. And uh, also the NASA has some stuff way out. The Voyager 2 is actually well beyond the heliopause, officially outside the solar system, interstellar space. And they had some communications problems with this. Uh, they did eventually manage to fix it, and, but it took them a while. And next slide, please. When they announced that this had happened, this is the headline that from the, the NASA press release about it. And you can see that it says, Voyager Communications Pause. And to be fair to them, further down in the uh, uh, press release, they explain what had happened. But uh, this shows that even butt covering is moving out into space. They didn't want to admit that they had sent the wrong signal. But now, as they say, they're, they're back in communications with it. Next slide, please. And there was a lot of talk about UFO research, research and NASA pre Congress pressed NASA to uh, do something about it, set up a, a panel. They did so. Next slide, please. And in September, they announced the, uh, the final report. They found no evidence of extraterrestrial UFOs, but they did find some that simply defied explanation. And you've probably heard a lot about the UN UFO whistleblower and Basically, nobody thinks he has any very, very credible, credible information. Next slide, please. And kind of as a sad point, Frank Borman, who was actually the commander of the Apollo 8 mission that circled the moon, actually died this year. He was uh, 95, actually. Next slide, please. Moving from the commercial, from the NASA's to the space war side of the US program, Next slide, please. There's a lot of risks with this. Uh, if there were a shooting war ever to develop, if you've ever seen the movie Gravity, uh, there's a chain reaction that destroys almost everything in low Earth orbit. And that is a real possibility because once you start blowing up satellites, they spent debris all over the place that debris hits other satellites that destroys them, more debris. It could be get very, very bad. Next slide, please. NASA, uh, the U.S. military space program is run by the U.S. Space Force, and they're a uh, branch under the Department of Air Force, and they've been around for about four years now. And most of the space activities that were in, in the city, Army, the Air Force, and Navy have been transferred to the Space Force, though not all of them. Next slide, please. And as this says, that their budget, their public announced budget is about $30 billion. So the public announced budget is beyond NASA's already, which, but the, everyone knows that there's a secret budget and nobody knows, at least nobody publicly knows exactly how much that is. The estimates are that it's probably another $30 billion. It might be less, it might be more. So you're talking about quite a lot of money being spent. The public stuff is basically the global positioning system and some other space communications. What the, uh, the hidden one is, we're not so sure. Next slide, please. And Space Force actually also had to use the Falcon Heavy for its very first mission this year. So as you can see, SpaceX and its launchers are pretty much getting to be everywhere. Next slide, please. The U.S. actually has a, a space plane, an X-37B military space plane, which has had several missions. Uh, it's now scheduled for its seventh mission. If you look closely, you can see at the bottom, there's an outline of the space shuttle and the X-37B compared in size. So you can see that the X-37B is a lot smaller than the uh, space shuttle is, but it's still uh, a useful tool. Next slide, please. They did have it actually scheduled 
They were projecting for a December 7th launch. They delayed that. They were projecting, they delayed that until may, possibly next week. But then they have some problems with their ground control system. So it's, it's going to go up sometime in the next couple of weeks. Exactly when is not so clear. And exactly what it's going to be doing is completely unclear. All the payloads on this are, are secretive. Next slide, please. Moving from the, U, the US, it's the largest space programs, to the Chinese, the second largest space program in the world. Next slide, please. They have a complete space program. They have a, a family of rockets, which they call the Long March program, the Long March satellites. And they, from small launchers to large, they have. Next slide, please. Their biggest manned program is their international uh, their space station. This is the second manned space station in orbit. So now there are two in orbit, the International Space Station and the Chinese Space Station. And they have plans to expand this in the coming years to make it even larger. Next slide, please. And this just gives you a, a kind of outline of what the satellite, the International Space Station is, 370 tons. The Mir space station was the last independent Russian station before they joined the International Space Station. And then the Chinese station is about 60 tons. And these drawings are all to scale, so they, you can compare what the, what the sizes of each one is. Next slide, please. And they also have an unmanned program. They actually had a rover on Mars, which they la landed last year. They put it into hibernation for the uh, Martian winter. It was supposed to rake up, up last month, or this was in January, it, but it didn't. And they had to admit eventually that it has, has failed on the surface of Mars, but they are planning other rovers as well. Next slide, please. And they're also having private companies, this first private sector launch got away, got off in 2023. So that's beginning to expand as well. Next slide, please. And they do have some, uh, you can call it a space dream. They want, they have reaching toward Mars and beyond. Next slide, please. Uh, they, they announced this year that they're going to have a planetary defense test. This is gonna basically be like the NASA DART test from a couple of years ago. Uh, crashing into an asteroid to see if they can, can divert it. And next slide, please. They are also very definitely want to have a manned landing on the moon. They are planning for that, they're building for it. Next slide, please. They're actually intending sometime for 2020, 2030. And since the US mission is planned for 2027, the US is a little bit of ahead but if there are any problems in the US program, it's, there's a small possibility that the Chinese might actually get to the moon with a, a man landing before we do. And this picture just shows the kind of base they, they hope to build later on after their manned landing. Next slide, please. They've actually, to show how serious they are, they're soliciting names for their manned lunar exploration vehicles from the public in China. So if you're holding a contest like that, you're pretty serious about what you're doing. Next slide, please. They also have a reusable space plane, which landed back in, in, on Earth after, in May. And we do not have a, a picture of that space plane. So the editors of the Space News decided to use uh, just a picture of the US space plane. But we believe it looks something like that. And this military, US military may have pictures, but they haven't released them. Next slide, please. There was this big problems with this uh, spy balloon. The question was, they have satellites, which they do, and spy satellites, and they're very good. Why use a balloon? Well, there are two reasons. One, people aren't considering a spy balloons all that much until this flap and also a satellite goes over a, a particular spot on earth fairly quickly and a balloon can actually hover over a, a, a particular base or whatever they're interested in fairly for a fairly long period of time next slide please 
moving on from the Chinese to another Asian space program, and that's the program of Japan. They have a full program, just like other of these other major programs. Next slide, please. They have a complete set of uh, launcher rockets, and they're working on their H3, which is going to replace their H2. And next slide, please. And this early this year, they actually did the first test of their H2, and it was destroyed a couple of minutes after, into launch. They're still working on trying to figure out what exactly happened and to fix it, but they're hoping to do the second test, a more successful test, uh, probably in the middle of this, of this year. Next slide, please. Japan does have a, a manned component. They have a laboratory, a manned laboratory on the International Space Station where as the Japanese astronauts can work in shirt sleeves and do experiments. They spent over a billion dollars on this laboratory some years ago. Next slide, please. And they actually are part of the Artemis program as well. I mentioned that next year they'll be sending a Canadian astronaut beyond the uh, orbit of Earth. Japan will eventually be sending a, a Japanese astronaut to the surface of the moon. This will be in probably Artemis six or seven uh, several years, but they picked their first astronauts to go to the moon on the Artemis program. Next, next slide, please. And they also joined the new moon race. They sent a, a, an unmanned probe to the moon and they launched an X-ray telescope as well. So they, they have a full program of unmanned and science systems as well. Next slide, please. We mentioned the Japanese private company that had an attempted landing on the moon. And as, as I said, th that company intends to continue with their program. Next slide, please. Moving from Asia to Europe, this is the European Space Agency. Now this is a little different from the other national programs. Next slide, please. In 1975, the U Western European nations realized that individually, France, Germany, Spain, Italy could not compete with the United States and Russia. So they pooled their efforts into the European Space Agency. And with all that pooled resources, they could compete. And after the Cold War ended, they actually expanded into the Eastern Europe, into the former Warsaw Pact. And they have uh, now 27 members and a few candidate members. And they have a full space program as well. Next slide, please. The European Space, this European Union actually also has a separate space budget. Uh, they, the European Union has to budget for seven years because it's so complicated to work their budgets out because there are so many nations involved now. Uh, so Europe is spending about four billion from the ESA and another roughly four billion on the European Space, European Union space program. So they have a, a very vigorous space program. Next slide, please. They have the, a manned program, a manned component. They have a, a satellite a, uh, laboratory on the International Space Station called Columbus, which has been up there for many years now. And again, the astronauts can come in in short sleeves and work on experiments. Next slide, please. They ha also have the Ariane launch system and they're on Ariane 5. And the first version was in the 70s, and they've had progressively better systems on the Ariane family. Next slide, please. They actually launched Ariane 5 for the final time in July. They launched a couple of communication satellites, and they are going to replace it. Next slide, please. With the Ariane 6, which you can see here. It was supposed to be flying now. First tests were supposed to be in uh, September of this year, but they, they've had delays, technical delays. So they're now looking for the first part of, of uh, next year for their first uh, Ariane 6 launch. Next slide, please. And Ariane 6 being delayed, the Vega, which is a small set launcher that they have, also has so had some problems. So this has led to a kind of crisis in the European launch systems. 
but the testing for Ariane is underway. Next slide, please. But they actually had a meeting in the middle of this year about European space ambitions. They actually want to get outside of NASA's shadow, because coming from being a little brother to a full partner. Next slide, please. And one of the things that they recommended for space autonomy was a European-led man lander within the next 10 years. And this is just the first proposal. They're going to the governments, will you give us money for this? They haven't gotten any money yet, but there's at least a possibility that there'll be three uh, systems for landing human beings on the moon within the next 10 years. There are definitely going to be two, the Artemis program, the Chinese program, which are getting ready to launch within the next couple of years. Then if they go forward with this plan, maybe even a European one as well. Next slide, please. They have unmanned programs all the way out into the solar system. Europe has a, a probe, an unmanned probe called Biba Colombo, which is uh, going to eventually go into orbit around Mercury. It's been doing flybys to slowly slow it down to go into orbit. They're probably going into orbit in 2026, but they returned a lot of nice images from that as well. Next slide, please. And the second to last Ariane launch actually sent ESA's JUICE mission to Jupiter. JUICE stands for Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. And it's aimed at Callisto and and the other icy moons around Jupiter. And they will be arriving probably near the end of this decade, about the same time that the NASA Clipper is arriving to look at uh, Europa. So next slide, please. And uh, they also just recently launched a Euclid mission, which is to look at the dark universe. The policy for the ESA is to launch European government programs on European rockets. They're having some problems. They didn't have a launcher, so they went to SpaceX. And SpaceX was able to launch this ESA Euclid mission into orbit for them. Next slide, please. And just uh, recently, they returned the first science programs, science images from the Euclid Space Telescope. And this is designed to chart the dark matter in the universe. You, you can't see the dark matter by definition. It doesn't give off any light or electromagnetic radiation. But by taking very careful pictures of the stars, they hope to be able to work out where the dark matter is by its gravitational effects. And they've returned the first of the uh, pictures from that, just in a, actually in October. Next slide, please. Moving from Europe and a, a multi-nation space program to another Asian space program, and that's in India. India, next slide, please, has a, wants to be a preeminent in space. This picture is a launch of their geostationary launcher. It's one of the more powerful ones in the world. Next slide, please. And they do have a space industry that they're working on. And they're actually, their space, Indian Space Research Organization, which is their NASA, is actually, working a lot more closely with their private companies than NASA is working with ours. Next slide, please. As I said, they have a complete lineup of, of satellite launchers. And this, these small cars are just a compact cars, gives you some idea of the sizes of their launchers. Next slide, please. And India launched a lunar mission. And it was a partial redo of a mission that had failed in 2019, and they launched it toward the moon. Next slide, please. And it actually did succeed in, in September of, or August, actually. And they, uh, it cost them less than the cost of a big sci-fi movie. And this picture here is, is the, the lander taken from a rover that it worked up away from the lander. They worked and returned information for uh, a full two weeks of a lunar day. Next slide, please. And Indira Modi is uh, India's prime minister. And on the day they actually succeeded in landing on the moon in August, he made a big announcement, India is on the moon. 
And they were very proud of it. They have every right to be very proud. It was quite an accomplishment. And they have a lot of other plans going forward. Next slide, please. They are also working on a, a manned mission to Earth orbit. They, in fact, had originally planned to actually have done this by now, but COVID hit them very hard and that delayed the mission quite a bit. But they are building a, a complete rocket and a manned capsule completely designed and built in India. And they hope to have it uh, launch the first manned Indian space program uh, and the mission sometime in the end of next year, more likely the beginning of the 2025. But it is possible the next time we do a space update that there will have been a manned Indian mission to Earth orbit. Next slide, please. And as I say, they're working hard on it. They just tested in October this launch escape system. So they're building the hardware. They have the capsules being readied. So fairly soon there will be a Indian manned mission in orbit. Next slide, please. Moving to the, the least of the national space programs. Many years ago, the Russian program was the biggest in the world. Now it's four now into some fairly hard times. Next slide, please. It is focused on the International Space Station along with the US and the other programs like, that have labs there. And this year, they had, next slide, please. They had, they did agree to operate through 2028 and they did hint pretty strongly that they'll continue to operate through 2023, but to 2030. So they will still be operating when the, when it's deorbited. Next slide, please. Beginning of the year, they actually had a, a coolant leak on the, one of their, their Soyuz space capsules, which is used to take the astronauts up and down. Next slide, please. They had no intention of sending astronauts back on a le leaking spacecraft. So they sent another Soyuz capsule up and that actually did succeed in returning the astronauts. They were no longer stuck. Uh, now, I, next slide, please. Uh, and after nearly 50 years, the Russians decided to go back to the moon with an unmanned system. And they launched their Lunar 25 mission hoping to land near the South Pole of the moon. Next slide, please. And that crashed into the moon. That didn't work properly. Uh, they're still trying to figure out exactly what happened with it. And then toward the end of the year, next slide, please. They developed another leak. Now this one isn't actually on a Soyuz. This is on an, one of the ISS modules, one of the ones that's permanently attached to the International Space Station. And they had a coolant leak in that, and they're, they're working to repair that. And you might say with the failed on the moon, all these leaks, what's going on with the Russian space program? The answer is corruption. The Indian, the Russian space government is very corrupt, very, very corrupt, and it corrupts everything, including the space program. So if they ever get rid of the corruption, they might get back to where they were. Next slide, please. And now the other space programs. As I said, there are 72 different ones and plus many, many small space, private space companies. So it's impossible to really cover all of them. Just mention a few. Next slide, please. There is actually a satellite was launched by the Vatican City. That is the uh, Catholic Church. And it's a small CubeSat that replaced uh, words of Pope Francis' speech that he gave in 20, 2020, and it's designed for radio enthusiasts to pick up a uh, there's this speech. So even the Vatican, even the Catholic Church has a space program. Next slide, please. Uh, well, this uh, North Korea actually launched a spy satellite, and it succeeded and is now in orbit. And will it make the region so safer? It's hard to say but uh, that's something that happened. Next slide, please. The United Arab Emirates is actually a small country that sits on a, an ocean of oil. So they have a lot of money and they decided both to attract their, their young people to STEM, cell, STEM missions, STEM science, 
and to diversify their economy. So they decided to have a space program. And they actually have put a, a, an unmanned probe around Mars. And they announced this year that they're actually going to be heading toward an asteroid belt and be visiting seven different asteroids in a couple of years. Next slide, please. And we mentioned maybe a space war. The Houthi rebels, which are in Yemen, have been shooting rockets at Israel as part of the, the Gaza war. And Israel did actually shoot down one of those missiles in space above the 50 mile line that's legally considered space. So there actually was a small military operations in space, uh, maybe pointing to a, a, a shooting war in space, which would not would be very bad. Next slide, please. And that gives a, a brief overview of some of the highlights. Couldn't get to all of them because there are now so many of them. But uh, there's a lot of activity now around the moon and several unmanned probes by private companies and by countries. So things are, are really happening in space. And next year will probably be better. Next slide. And at this point, I'd be willing to, uh, to entertain any questions that I can try and answer. Uh, okay, we had one question in the chat I was able to answer. It had to do with the Space Force, and we've had some lively uh, discussions in the chat. Now, some folks did ask uh, questions when they filled out uh, their registration. Uh and a number of the most of them really don't have anything to do with the year in space, but they're darn interesting anyway. So um, one that caught my eye that is kind of relevant uh, is the question of how to differentiate uh, among the various launch companies. That depends on having information about them. And since they're private companies, they don't have to announce all that much. They can if they want to. They're, they're perfectly free to, to, to release as much information as they want. But they're worried about their competitors as well. So it's kind of hard from the outside to differentiate them. Some of them are probably going to fail. But some of them are, are going to succeed. And I would love to be able to give you a list of those especially since then I could go to the list and buy some of their stock. But uh, it's really hard from the outside because they are private or organizations to differentiate them. Mm -hmm. uh, another question I, that was asked, and I know this was something of a concern earlier this year, and it had to do with the, the cost associated uh, with the Mars sample return mission. Uh, and one of the folks who registered asked the question, uh, could you please update us on plans to reduce the Mars sample return so that missions like Europa Lander will not suffer? That they are still discussing. They know they have to, to change the, the operation because of the costs have gone up above a billion dollars well above a billion dollars. And that's just from projecting from here, they figured it would grow beyond that. So they are uh, working to redo it, to find some way to do it cheaper, but they have several proposals about how to reduce it, how to make it cheaper. They haven't decided on it, which one to, to actually use, or maybe they'll even come up with a different one. So, okay. I'd like to be able to answer that question, but right now, NASA doesn't have an answer. They're still working on the answer. Yeah. Um, another one, it's uh, more general in nature. Uh, what is the most common pattern observed in 2023 space activities? Patterns. Uh, I... I so is it would you 
put it into the category of uh in terms of let's say similarities uh space security or robotic exploration commercial space developments are there any common themes that we've seen this year there are a lot of unmanned probes to the surface of the moon several of them are by by countries the u.s is planning one uh, china is, is planning another one but there are at least three we mentioned the japanese one and there are a couple of uh uh, American ones as well, and possibly some outside that, that aren't as well known. So getting back to the moon in competition with several several different private companies trying to compete to get to the moon. So that's a, a good sign and a good pattern. And pattern, uh, the moon is beginning to get a lot more attention than it has in the past. Other patterns, the launching of all of these uh, vast uh, low Earth orbit communications programs. Oh, the, the uh, constellation networks? Constellation networks. There's, we talked about Starlink, which has 5,000 satellites in orbit now and planning up to 12,000. Blue Origin actually has a, a program which is going to have almost as many satellites, if not more. They, and they're beginning to launch those. And there are some private companies, China, a private Chinese company is actually trying to build a, uh, a large, again, with thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit. So there are going to be a lot of satellites in low Earth orbit in the next few years. Yeah, we got a lot to look forward to. Now, there was one question that really caught my eye because I remember there was discussion uh, about extension of uh, some of the SLS contracts. And I don't know if this was earlier this year or late last year, but the question is, how many SLSs are the U.S. taxpayers on the hook to have manufactured? Have you heard anything about that? The... I believe the contracts are mostly uh, undetermined. Is it, I don't forget what they call them. Indefinite delivery contracts, which means that NASA asks, will decide. There's, no, there's not a set number. They, they're not committed to, to just say five. NASA asks them for five. And if NASA wants to want six or seven or 10 or, or none, then NASA asks them again. So there's no set limit on these contracts. It's basically what NASA wants them to build. Of course, they have to give them notice many years in advance, but... As well as termination costs. And termination costs, yeah. Uh, another interesting question uh, I saw is, I'll go to a more specific one first. How is Israel's space program after their failed moon landing attempt from a couple of years back. And uh, that was a nonprofit organization. Uh, yeah, they have been able to, to uh, raise the money to try again, though they'd like to. And as far, as far as anything else, the Israelis were planning some stuff, but then October 7th happened. They're in the middle of a, a very expensive war. So they have to concentrate everything on that. So I don't see the Israeli space program doing very much until they settle this war and can okay. divert the money back to the space program. Another interesting question uh, that we got asked, uh, and if you think about it, there have been uh, a lot of industries that have had difficulties that they point to the disruptions associated uh, with the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, this question is, what were the most difficult challenges the space sector faced since the pandemic until today? Getting back to the, to uh, coming together, we had to do everything by, by, uh, by Zoom, as did it virtually everyone else with the coronavirus. And they have to get their people back into working together. 
that's been one of the problems because a lot not a lot but there's this there's this percentage of the workers who actually prefer working from home and there's there's some tensions about you know come back to work and the other they want to say no we, we can work from home mm -hmm. that the that's one of the problems with the coronavirus that has come up which it still hasn't been resolved so uh, another one of the folks who registered asked the question, what lessons could we learn from the major developments of 2023 in space? I don't know if it's a lesson, but it is, the space program is becoming much larger. It, the NSS mission is a spacefaring civilization and low earth orbit is now part of Earth civilization. So very slowly, we are beginning to move into to space. Right now, this, the component is mainly unmanned, but it does give me hope for the future that the goal of the National Space Society is beginning to come, uh, come true, not as fast as I would like. I mean, I would say if, if there was someone was sending a colonizing mission, I'd certainly get on the second one. <laughs> I, I'm 72, and you get that old, you get a lot of cautious. But uh... well, now on that note, that's kind of a perfect lead, and I was hesitating about asking this question because it really doesn't directly pertain to tonight's topic. Uh, but one person wanted to know how close are we to extracting? industrially usable resources from the moon? Hmm. From the moon, I think it was pretty far away, but uh, because there's such a high gravity well, even, even though it's a lot smaller than the earth, it's still a gravity well that you have to overcome. We're actually probably closer. There are several companies. They have announced space mining uh, systems, unmanned space mining systems to the asteroids. And since they don't have to overcome the, the gravity well of the moon, getting that material back to the Earth orbit and make use of it, it's probably going to be easier because you're not fighting gravity. So I think that might be the place where most, or the most current one, or the soonest that we can expect some usable stuff to come back. Yeah, we just barely touched on this subject at, at the November 30th space forum. And I think it would be, hey, Bert, you know, perhaps a good idea for one of the uh, future space forums to uh, discuss the challenges as well as the practicalities of, uh, you know, mining operations. Uh Bert, how are we uh, on time at this point? We uh, you are want... a little bit past. Uh, do you want to do a couple more questions and then we'll call it an evening? I can certainly do that. No open questions at the moment. So I'm going I, I to do have one for Larry. Yes. Yeah, Larry, I, I mean, you've, you've done this for us for the last few years and it's always quite interesting. Uh, is there anything that occurred in 2023 that surprised you that maybe you didn't expect? The uh, failures of the Russian program. I had underestimated just how how badly corrupted it had become. And before, when I started the, the doing these 40 years ago, they were really the, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, space program and they've fallen so far i was surprised by that they haven't really begin to begun to recover as as i'm sure they hope they will but yes it was once a very proud space program yes it was and we were very proud to have sponsored a speaking tour here in chicago of uh got I can't remember it's Gretchko, one of the Russian comments. I'm drawing a blank, Georgie Gretchko. Uh, and it was very interesting uh, to hear 
an insider uh, perspective on, you know, the way things were done, because he was obviously uh, a cosmonaut under the Soviet Union. Yeah. Uh, so I'd be curious to know how space insiders there view the difference in terms of let's say bureaucratic environment between soviet days versus uh today's you know russia under putin um one other question that maybe is is looking forward uh is there anything larry that you're especially excited about that will come up in 2024 the uh uh Duplication of the Apollo 8 mission, the, the Artemis 2, with people going away from the Earth, orbit of the Earth for the first time in 50 years, swinging around the moon. That, I think, was going to be really exciting. That will be, yes. I absolutely agree on that one. Let's see. Anything? Anybody else have any additional questions? Or we will say goodnight to everybody. It looks like so. I just want to say, uh, Larry, thank you very much for that. It's uh, nice to do uh, it. again great. Uh, and I also want to thank everybody uh, who's in attendance. We had some great conversations going on in the chat. So you guys definitely uh, uh, made it an enlightening experience. And I just want to remind everyone that Larry and I are officers with Chicago Society for Space Studies, and we are a chapter of the National Space Society. So if you're in Northeastern Illinois, you really got to go check us out, chicagospace.org. Uh, if you're not, then you really should go to the NSS website, which is now at nss.org. The space has been dropped. Uh, in the menu, click on the Get Involved uh, link option, and then from there, click on the Local Chapters link, and look and see if there's actually a chapter near you, uh, because it's the NSS chapters that are responsible for bringing space into your community, and so you should really try to hook up uh, with a local chapter, and I've just pasted the URL uh, for the chapter directory into the chat. So with that, I am going to turn control back over to Mr. Burt. Thank you. I, you know what? I see one hand raised. Should we try to get that? Oh. Uh, uh, let me do that. Let's see. We're, we're on. We might as well. Uh, oh, well, okay. Two, uh, two hands probably... raised now. Okay, yeah, everybody. We'll, we'll try to answer them. <laughs> I see one question now from Martin. Now he's asking about protection from near Earth uh, meteorites. Is there anything new in the planetary defense arena? Besides the, the announcement that the Chinese are going to, in 2019, we talked about it, are going to do a test. That That's about the newest thing that right. happened there. And everyone else is still working on it, but it's just a lot of paper studies going on. Very good. I think that was Martin's question. So he had his hand raised. Let me yes. uh, allow David to talk. David, I'm going to allow you to talk. You just have to take your uh, mic off of mute. David, can you hear us? Oh, perhaps not. Or he might have stepped away momentarily. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, with that, everybody, uh, I, I think we're ready to uh, close out. So I do also want to extend my thanks uh, to uh, you, Larry, for always a, an incredibly comprehensive summary in such a short time. Did you say that we had a, we went through 130 some slides? 130 some. <laughs> wow. <okay. laughs> you do that very, very fast. So we, we appreciate that. So thank you so much for, for doing this. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we welcome you back next year uh, as we do in 2024. And Jim, thank you again also for moderating. Uh, it makes my night easier. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. <laughs> I appreciate that. And again, all you, all you both do uh, in support of the National Space Society and certainly the Chicago Society for Space Studies. So thank you that, for doing that.
Uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Fred Becker, uh, Fred, for always uh, all the support he's given over the course of the last few years as we've done these space forms on the technical side. So, Fred, thank you so much. And to our audience, we're, as we close out this year, uh, and we've had a lot of great sessions. So we really appreciate your support. We're looking forward to another great year next year. So stay tuned. So I'm going to share my screen one last time. And uh, we'll get to my last slide as we get into this holiday season here. Uh, so I do want to thank everybody again. Uh, wishing you a wonderful holiday season. Wishing you a happy and healthy new year. Uh, for those of you in our time zones, again, have a great evening. For those in tomorrow's, have a great day. And to everyone, uh, have a super weekend. And uh, we'll see you after the new year. So everyone, take care. Thank All you. Right. Yeah. Good night, everyone. All right.